This book has great power to change a life, to change your life. When I pulled it out of the box after I got it in the mail from the used bookstore, I saw it had this really unique cover and it was square instead of rectangle. And I couldn't really make out the title that easily, but I just felt the power of the book as soon as I opened the box. And it might sound odd, but it really did happen that way. It was just powerful. And this copy was very used. It was banged up. And I wanted to know the story that this book took. Like I was actually interested in the travels that it must have gone through and the people that it interacted with. Uh, the cover price of the book was listed as $3, and the copy was published in the early 1970s. Be Here Now was written by Ram Dass, and it's probably would be more accurate to say that it was lived by him. It's a story of his life. It's a story of his spirituality. It's this great journey that he went on. And it remains a keystone of the modern spiritual movement in the United States and other parts of the Western world. And it went a long way and getting people in the West to practice and respect the Eastern religions of Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. And if you've read this book, go down to the comments right now while you're watching this video and let me know what your thoughts are on Be Here Now. It's interesting because Ram Dass wasn't always Ram Dass. He wasn't always the holy man who found his way to India. You know, he once had this Judeo-Christian name and life. He taught at Harvard. He also taught at Berkeley at Stanford. He was this pillar of the academic community. And I guess you could say he was this textbook upper middle class American who lived in Cambridge and lived the American dream, the quote unquote American dream. Except for him, he wasn't living the dream. It didn't add up to him. And all this academic expertise that he had in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy it didn't make sense to him because when he looked at the establishment all around him, the treatments they were using, he saw the people that were teaching this and that were therapists and, and helping people were living all these messed up lives or even more messed up than the people that they treated. And so he asked himself if the, method, if the methods they were employing were so successful and true, why weren't he and his peers and his colleagues living this peaceful, happy, and fulfilled life. And I think that was back then and even remains an excellent question. There's more to life than just science. There's more to life than just psychoanalysis. There's this spiritual alignment. There's mind, body, soul working together. And therapy can be a huge part of that. I'm not taking anything away. But ultimately, he felt he was living a lie and playing a game that had no end. And that he was just moving pieces around, and he was being moved as a piece himself. And that there had to be a better way, something, anything uh, more than what he was doing. And even though he'd been given keys to the kingdom with this professorship at Harvard, research grants, seats on federal committees, and he led this whole department at Harvard, it wasn't, it wasn't enough. He drove a Mercedes. He owned a Cessna plane. He owned a sailboat, but he still didn't feel like he was living his life. And I want to emphasize there how relatable this book is for almost anybody who reads it. I think that it would resonate across this great cross-section of people in modern society. It's approachable, and he's a great storyteller. He can really put you into this moment and describe it in a way that is so valuable. And we don't usually get raw insight like this from books. Authors can't always transport us into this other reality, their own story, their own journey in this magical way. We make this content to have discussions with each of you. And if you like what we're doing, if you appreciate it, please subscribe by hitting the watermark in the lower right hand corner. Ram Dass was friends with Timothy Leary, Adex Huxley, and other notable people of that era. And his relationship with Timothy Leary would prove to be life changing for him. Leary was experimenting with psychedelics and Ram Dass became engaged with this work that Leary was doing on psychedelics. It started out with psilocybin but would expand. The first time that, that Leary gave Ram Dass psilocybin, Ram Dass had this critically important psychedelic trip. He saw himself uh, as a professor and he saw himself 
moving that aside and leaving the fact that he was a professor. He saw that he wasn't a socialite and he saw that he wasn't a cellist because he played the cello, but that wasn't who he was. And all these layers kept peeling off of him and he watched it happen to himself. And then to his horror, his body disappeared. And then he clearly got the message that he didn't need flesh and bones because that wasn't him either. And so all that was left was the self, that divine self with a capital S, or awareness, or original consciousness, or the divine, whatever you want to call it. And so he wasn't any of those things. And there's a parallel there to this great work by Ramana Maharishi. And there's a school of yoga that Ramana Maharishi taught that asked the question, who am I? Because we aren't our name, and we aren't our profession. We aren't our friends, or our relationships, or our any of these things. So when you ask that question, you deeply reflect on it. Who am I? And so Ram Dass, Timothy Leary, and a couple of others at Harvard went forward and started to do all these experiments with psychedelics of all different kinds. And they started with psilocybin, they moved on to LSD, and that became their most common drug that they would use because of the way that it was developed and the stability of it. They tested it on a wide range and cross-section of subjects. And at one point, they even tested it on a group of 20 ministers who were in the advanced part of their seminary study. And 10 of them got LSD and 10 of them got a placebo. And Ram Dass relates that it was kind of comical because it was pretty clear which got LSD and which ones got the placebo. Because a couple of these seminary students that had received LSD stumbled through this sanctuary. They were actually doing the LSD in this church. And these, these priests were stumbling through the sanctuary saying loudly, I see God, I see God. <laughs> and, you know, I, every time I, I talk about this story, every time I read it, it makes me laugh. Um, it also speaks to the power of the divine. It speaks to the power of psychedelics where these guys might have, been holy but they got a glimpse of something and it's interesting because they saw god when they took this this substance and yet they'd been studying years on this path they'd been studying uh, books and written word and taken tests and gotten lectures but all it took was this one substance they took it and they saw divine they saw the universe and they called it god and so Ram Dass had seen the divine. He'd seen the beyond, just like these potential priests had. But he got frustrated because he couldn't stay there. And he and Leary and these other guys that were in this program studying the effects of psychedelics and trying to figure it out, they weren't able to maintain that tie to that universal oneness, that connection to everything. And so he and Leary... They kept trying to get behind that experience, behind the psychedelics, to map it. That was what the studies were all about. And that's probably a bit like scientists trying to get behind consciousness, physicists trying to figure out what is consciousness. Even Max Planck, the father of quantum physics, says that's not necessarily possible. We know that science still can't do it. So they couldn't map what the psychedelics were and where it took them. So with 300 trips on various psychedelics under his belt, he flamed out at Harvard. He kind of crashed and burned. He didn't want that life anymore. He didn't want to keep going on that path. And so he asked himself, what's next? And so Timothy Leary and a few of their other associates had already gone to India and surrounding areas to find answers. And Ram Dass decided that he would go and see what he could find. But he already knew that his friends had gone there and hadn't found what they'd been seeking. And, but he was still committed to go and, and dig deeper and dive deeper and, and go further than they went. And I think it's a great perspective. You know, he knew they'd gone, they hadn't found the answers, but he believed that he could go and commit himself and find the way. And I'd take a minute and ponder everything that he left behind all the relative fame that he had in the education and academic community, all his worldly possessions, and he just left it all behind 
And that was to go pursue what he sought and what he knew existed out there, even if he couldn't quite explain it. That's powerful stuff. I talk about it a lot on this channel, but belief is this amazing thing. When we believe, amazing things happen. So he and another affluent friend of his went to Tehran, and they'd had a Land Rover that they'd purchased shipped there. So they went from Tehran and Iran, they drove into Afghanistan, and hung out, they bought some hash, and then drove on to India. So if you can imagine this guy, these two dudes from Harvard and Cambridge, show up in Tehran, have a Land Rover, drive to Afghanistan, buy some hash, and then keep driving on through Pakistan to India. It's, it's just crazy. And they visited Kashmir and all these other breathtaking areas. It was this amazing experience that they were on, this amazing journey they were on. But even though they visited all these holy sites and they interacted with holy men and gurus, they weren't truly necessarily experiencing India. They were staying in five-star hotels. They had a guide. They were only eating semi-local food in these really nice five-star hotels. They weren't really in it. They weren't really living it or experiencing the place they were in. They weren't, they weren't there. And so they were there, but they didn't see it. And it had been weeks, and Ram Dass was sitting in a restaurant, and he was in a particularly bad state of mind because he was upset that he hadn't been able to find the way that he'd been dedicated to. And as he was sitting there in this restaurant, this six foot seven tall white guy walks in with flowing hair and he comes right over and sits down at their table. And this guy starts talking to them, just having a conversation. And Ram Dass was supposed to go to Japan with his friend that was traveling with him and then go back to Cambridge. But suddenly in that moment, he decided that he was going to stay with this giant man whose name was Bhagwan Das. And Bhagwan Das told Ram Das that he would be following him through India in both the figurative and literal sense, following him spiritually and following him literally. And so Ram Das set out and the journey began. And this was the real journey. So they set off, they were sleeping on tables in various monasteries. Ram Das was struggling with dysentery because now he's finally starting to eat local food. So he's sick. Uh, but he says that he began to learn things. He began to see things. And Bhagwan Das knew everyone. So when they would go to a monastery or a temple or a spiritual place, everyone would know who Bhag Bhagwan Das was. And it wouldn't matter if they were in a Buddhist temple or a Hindu temple or a Jain temple. All these different monks and priests, they all knew this guy. And he was readily accepted in all these different places and was revered in all these places. And Ram Das would eventually meet Bhagwan Das's guru in the foothills of the Himalayas. And he saw this flash of enlightenment. It wasn't this full knowing yet, but he had a flash of it. And he set, this set him on a path to begin his journey to become a guru himself. At one point, he gave this older guru a massive dose of pure LSD that he'd been carrying with him. And it didn't do anything to the guru. And this shocked Ram Das because this was a large dose. This was a large hit of LSD. And he thought to himself, well, I guess it makes sense because why would a drug that shows the divine be of any impact on this guru who's already sitting with the divine himself? And I think that's a particularly powerful moment in this story. Ram Dass touches on it, and I agree that as a society, there's, there's a part of our society that's become jaded and cynical. We have to over-question every single thing. We want all this logic and common sense to prevail every single time, and we're conditioned to deny that magic exists. We're conditioned to deny that wonder exists in the world. We've, I think, willfully become somewhat nihilistic, and I'm not sure that we even know it. And I think that's kind of sad that we're so literal. And Ram Dass says about this, we're living in a society which is a temple dedicated to the rational man. And I mean, it's okay that we have rational thought. It's okay that we have logic and common sense and science. I, I believe in all that. But we can't worship it. 
And we can't become prisoners of our own mind. And that's what we're doing. We become prisoners inside here. And then this quiet dominates us. But, you know, you can break free from that. To escape this prison, you simply walk through the wall. And all the wall is is your own mind. You know, you're, you're only being contained by yourself. But I'm going to choose to believe, to see the magic, to try and know the unknowable, and to see these actual realities around us that some people can't sense because of how closed off they've become and we've become as a society. For me, I think it helps that I never completely grew up. You know, I think being a lost boy and never growing up kind of has its benefits because we, we stay in touch with that magic. And so I'd encourage each of you to get in touch with your magic. Think about the energy of a room when someone that's angry or sad or grieving walks in, or maybe they're amused or happy or ecstatic, nervous, relieved, relaxed, any, any of these emotions. And they walk into a room and it completely changes the energy of that room. And you can feel it. You can know it. You can sense it. You almost swim in it sometimes. The energy is so powerful. That's, that's power. And that's magic. And you can change energy. You can change the energy of a room. That in of itself is also magic. That's real magic. Magic isn't this supernatural thing. It's this perfectly natural thing. And you're a magician. You can actually change your reality. And if your reality is powerful enough... It can overpower the reality of the collective around you. And where does that end? Like, like that's, that's amazing when you start to kind of peel that back. But this book isn't just about that. It touches on it. It definitely speaks to it. But it's about finding the divine. Ultimately, like many other books that I've read and I've talked about on this channel, it's about salvation or the truth. And definitely read this book. That, like, again, like I said in the beginning, it has great power. Ram Dass says, the most exquisite paradox, as soon as you give it all up, you can have it all. And I'll repeat that. As soon as you give it all up, you can have it all. So ask yourself, what are you holding on to so tightly? What if you let go? Where does that let you go? And there's something that pulls a person towards this journey. Think about it for a second. Pause and reflect on it. Are you being pulled somewhere? Something deep inside. You know, we're all on a journey, whether we realize it or not. You're on a journey. So tell me about your journey in the comments. And if you're not on a journey, I'd like to know why you think that you're not on a journey. Some of us may be guided to go on this journey by others. Some of us may choose to go on this journey on our own. We may feel compelled from within to do it. And some of us may feel that we don't have any other, any other choice but to go on the journey. We can both be taught and teach others along the way. Remember this theme that comes through in this book, that there's an incredibly short distance to travel to the divine. We think it's complicated, but it really isn't. And there's a lot more to this book than everything I've covered so far. The middle section is just Ram Dass's sketches, and it's interspersed with words and quotes and bits of insight. It's, it's so free and free flowing and it's just kind of amazing. It's very sexy. It's kind of heavy. It's pretty cool. And parts of the book are like a comparative religion book where he's basically explaining whether you're Christian or Hindu or a Taoist or a new age spiritualist, we're all saying the same thing. We're all, we're all seeing very similar things when it comes to spirituality or religion. And so I think reading that from him really brings us together, which is an amazing thing. And there's a whole section of this book with quotes from all these famous and spiritual people from around the world and throughout time. And they're some of the best quotes you'll ever find. And I find that as I read through them, a lot of them I'd never heard before. So let me know what you think about the discussion we're having here right now. Does any of this make you think about something powerful? Hit me up in the comments and I will always get back to you. For a peaceful and open-minded community where people can share their journeys, be themselves, where we have discussions just like this, visit kishar.org. Uh, join up. Go check us out and join our community. And please like this video if you want us to keep making content just like this and share it with friends or family if you think it might help them out. We're always looking to make the world a brighter place. And until next time, I wish you peace on your journey.